My name is Vicki Tagalakis. I'm Division Director of General Internal Medicine at McGill University, Montreal, Canada, and I am a thrombosis physician specialist. I specialize in the treatment and management of thrombotic disorders. Case study, anticoagulation and obesity. Mr. D is a 71-year-old man, a retired accountant. His body mass index is 44.3 kilograms per meter squared. Uh, specifically, his height is 190 centimeters and his weight is 160 kilos. Past medical history includes diabetes type 2, hypertension, a prior episode of a deep vein thrombosis following ankle surgery. Uh, he just had open cholecystectomy and his crown clearance is 55 mils per minute. Full surgical anticoagulation is then uh, is determined uh, because the patient has been admitted to the ward following surgery. What do you recommend regarding VT prophylaxis? Obesity is a significant risk factor for venous thromboembolism. There are multiple prothrombotic mechanisms involved. The relative risk for a first venous thromboembolism with a BMI of over 30 milligrams per meter squared has been addressed in a meta-analysis of 21 case control studies and cohort studies that followed over 63,000 patients. And as a, you can see in this uh, table, uh, the, uh, the uh, BMI was a significant risk factor uh, for an odds ratio close to two as a summary estimate for venous thromboembolism. Mr. D scores high on the Comprini VT risk assessment score for surgical patients, and so thromboprophylaxis is indicated. There are many scoring systems to address uh, prophylaxis indication. The Caprini is one of them that is used for surgical patients. And his score is high enough to indicate that thromboprophylaxis should be instituted. Uh, note that weight-based dosing should be considered for obese patients, even in prophylaxis. Thromboprophylaxis following surgery for morbidly obese patients has been studied. Uh, there's a significant body of data in obese patients, but it is largely derived from studies of bariatric surgery for the morbidly obese. Unfortunately, the quality of evidence is quite low in this population. Most studies are observational and retrospective, uh, but many prospective studies evaluated the impact of increasing dose of low molecular weight heparin on anti-10A levels. So, the, the, the issue here is that anti tnl levels do not necessarily correlate well with clinical outcomes. So yes, your study can show that there's an association, uh, but whether or not this translates into a clinical outcome uh, cannot be uh, uh, ascertained. And finally, there are only a few randomized trials available, and they're relatively small. The strategies that we have to improve outcomes have included vis-a-vis -vis thromboprophylaxis in the obese population undergoing surgery. The strategies are increased fixed dose has been looked at, um, increasing uh, the uh, units per kilo dosing, and extending prophylaxis beyond the hospital stay. All are strategies that have been looked at uh, for thromboprophylaxis in the morbidly obese patient following surgery. What is the evidence? So majority of studies have evaluated enoxaparin in bariatric surgery. There's really no level one evidence, however, uh, meaning uh, in the sense that these studies are, are um, looking at specifically a bariatric patient population and not an obese patient population. One single center study of 481 consecutive patients looked at 40 milligrams twice a day uh, versus uh, 30 milligrams twice a day. And the 40 milligrams twice a day was shown to reduce the incidence of venous thromboembolism without an increase in bleeding. Another single center study of 308 consecutive patients, in this case, patients receiving 30 milligrams twice a day pre- and post-operatively until discharge, were compared to those re receiving 30 milligrams twice a day post-operatively and then 40 milligrams once a day extended for 10 days post-discharge. So here we have an extension past the discharge. And what was noted was that extending prophylaxis reduced the risk of venous thromboembolism from 4.5% to 0%, and there was less bleeding. Uh, studies of dose adjustments and or extending therapy have also been done with unfractionated heparin, other low molecular weight heparins, fondoparanox, and warfarin. 
There's been no randomized trials analyzing prophylaxis of venous thromboembolism in obese patients undergoing non-bariatric surgery. So this is a caveat that we have to keep in mind. When we look at weight-adjusted heparin prophylaxis among obese patients undergoing bariatric surgery, there was a systematic review done of six studies, including over 1,800 patients assessed whether a weight-based postoperative thromboprophylaxis dose regimen is safe and effective. And we see that generally, yes, a weight-adjusted heparin versus non-weight-adjusted heparin, um, there was a non-significant trend towards a lower rate of inpatient VT complications without an increased rate of major bleeding. So how should obese non-bariatric surgical patients be managed? Let's look at some of the guidelines. The international clinical practice guidelines vary in their dose management recommendations for obese patients. For example, the American College of Chest Physicians 2012 edition suggests weight-based dosing, and the European Society of Anesthesiology 2017 suggests a higher fixed prophylaxis dose in patients with a BMI of over 40 kilos per meter squared. Uh, Thrombosis Canada does have some guideline statements regarding dosing recommendations by weight, and you can see them here uh, where the different categories of weight include less than 40 kilos, 40 to 100 kilos, and 101 to 120 kilos for the various low molecular weight heparin. So if we return back to our, our patient, um, Mr. D uh, has finished with his surgery, received his prophylaxis hospital, he was sent home, and then he presents back to the emergency room uh, department four weeks following surgery with left calf pain and swelling of two days duration. Um, he uh, has a D-dimer, which is positive, and then undergoes a Doppler, which shows a popliteal DVT. His cram clearance is 55 mils per minute. What would you do now? Specifically, can you use a direct oral anticoagulant to treat Mr. D's DVT? And if so, which one? Please deliberate now. So, uh, Mr. D's weight is 160 kilos, which is above the 120 kilos, uh, where uh, recommendations cannot really be made with the various direct oral anticoagulants. Um, because these have not been extensively studied in patients with, whose weight is above 120 kilos. Therefore, none of the DOACs or the direct oral anticoagulants can be recommended. And that as such, Mr. D was started on enoxaparin 1 milligram per kilo subcutaneous BID and warfarin 5 milligrams once a day. Once his INR was above 2, the enoxaparin was stopped and the patient was kept only on warfarin for a total duration of 3 months. Uh, DOAX and the ob obese patients, if we looked again at uh, the data, we know that no approved direct oral anticoagulant has a dose adjustment for high weight or BMI uh, or high BMI in obese categories. There is uncertainty about DOAC efficacy and safety in the obese population. There have been no randomized clinical trials of direct oral anticoagulants administered to large numbers of obese patients. And the subgroup analyses of obese patients included in the classic phase three direct oral anticoagulant trial suggest that direct oral anticoagulants are efficacious and safe in these patients, but nonetheless, these are subgroup analyses, and moreover, the patient numbers are quite small in these analyses to make any uh, firm conclusion. Do we have any uh, guidelines uh, from any societies or guidance statements? And the International Society of Thrombosis and Hepostasis has gone ahead and provided some guidance in this area, and they recommend appropriate standard dosing of the direct oral anticoagulants in patients with a BMI less than or equal to 40 kilos per meter squared and weight less than or equal to 120 kilos for venous thromboembolism treatment, prevention of venous thromboembolism, and prevention of ischemic stroke and systemic arterial embolism in non-valvular AFib. That's the guidance statement from the ISTH, where they are recommending that the direct oral anticoagulants be used in appropriate dosing uh, in patients with those specific weights. 
They then say, we suggest that direct oral anticoagulants should not be used in patients with a BMI of over 40 kilos per meter squared or a weight of over 120 kilos because really there are limited clinical data available for patients in the extreme of weight. And the available pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic evidence that exists suggests that decreased drug exposures, reduced peak concentrations, and shorter half-lives occur with increasing weight, which raises concerns about underdosing in this population at the extreme of weight. If DOEX are to be used in this patient population, so if we do go ahead and, 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 and consider using this medication, uh, this antiqua these anticoagulants in patients in extreme of weight, specifically over 40 kilos per meter squared of a BMI or over 120 kilos, the ISTH subcommittee suggests checking a drug-specific peak and trough level, so anti-factor 10A for apixaban, edoxaban, and rivaroxaban, and the eccrine time or dilute thrombin time uh, with appropriate calibrators for delta parent or mass spectrometry drug level for any of the DOACs. If the levels fall within the expected range, you can, you want, one would continue uh, the DOAC uh, at that current dosing. However, if the drug-specific level is found to be low, uh, below the expected range, um, there is a suggestion to change to a vitamin K antagonist rather than adjusting the dose of the direct oral anticoagulant. This concludes the presentation. Thank you for your time.